welcome to Women's Human Rights Campaign, um, our meeting, which is on women's sex-based rights. And we're here at the, the 2021 UN NGO Forum um, to talk about women's sex-based rights. Women's Human Rights Campaign is the leading global organization campaigning to defend women's sex-based rights. The main focus is on defending um, our rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. You can find more about women's uh, human rights campaign at our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you'll find our declaration on women's sex-based rights, which has been signed by 15,936 people from 129 countries worldwide. And it's supported by 319 organizations. We want to warn you that this event covers some adult themes, which some will find distressing. And we advise that children should not watch it. Today, we've, I'm delighted to introduce our fantastic uh, range of panelists. We have Sheila Jeffries from the UK. She's the Women's Human Rights Campaign Director. Gunda Schumann from Germany, from uh, uh, LAZ Reloaded, Anna Kerr from Australia, Feminist Legal Clinic, Principal Solicitor, Marie-Claire Faré from Democratic Re Con Republic of Congo, Common Cause UK, Democratic Re Republic of Congo. She's a research scientist and freelance consultant on gender and human rights. She is a defender. We also have Rochelle Dean, on, from the Bahamas. She's the Women's Human Rights Com Campaign Country Contact. Then we have Kathleen Lowry from Canada, University of Alberta, Associate Professor of Anthropology, followed up from Argentina. So you can see with this great range of different countries in the world, Maria Benetti from IIEGE UBA, Conicet, Argentina. She's a researcher in feminist philosophy. Then Cara Dansky from the United States, Women's Human Rights Campaign Chair of the Committee on Law and Legislation. And Linda Lewis from India, who is a, um, a human rights lawyer. Eugenia Rodriguez from Brazil, spokesperson of Non Corpo Certo, and then um, Amparo Domingo from Spain, the Women's Human Rights Country Contact in Spain. So I'm so delighted to um, pass now to our first speaker, Sheila Jeffries. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk today about why the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights was created two years ago. When CEDAW, the Women's Convention, was adopted in 1979, it was firmly understood that women's oppression was based on sex. CEDAW states that discrimination against women is any discrimination based upon sex. Gender is not mentioned in the convention and the word was not much used by feminists at that time. The term sex role stereotypes was used in the convention to mean the restrictions and expectations culturally enforced upon women on the basis of sex. CEDAW says that states' parties should seek to abolish them because they are the justification for women's oppression. Gradually, however, the word gender came to be used more often in women's human rights work as a substitute for the term sex role stereotypes, but it had the same meaning. At the same time that the word gender was taking over from sex in human rights work, a development took place that now seriously threatens women's rights as human rights. This was a movement for transgender rights. The transgender rights activists were overwhelmingly what were previously called transvestites, men who were, according to sexologists, the scientists of sex, masochistically sexually excited by wearing women's clothes and women's body parts and going out in public pretending to be women. These men asserted that they had innate female gender identities and shall have the right to express those identities in all public and women's spaces. Instead of wanting to abolish sex stereotypes, as feminists did and as CEDAW called for, they fashioned identities based on sex stereotypes because these were masochistically exciting for them. They called these gender identities but they should more accurately be called 
sex stereotype identities. Transvestites in the US drew up a bill of transgender rights in the mid 1990s, and they initiated a campaign nationally and internationally for their gender or sex stereotype rights. The transvestites needed to hide their sexual motivations because that might mean that they were not seen as an appropriate rights bearing category. Therefore, they created a gender ideology, which asserts that people can be born into the wrong body and acquire the wrong sexed brain. The ideology has been widely adopted and was used to create an industry of the transgendering of children, as if children could somehow be born with a body that was wrong because it did not suit their gender. The importance of recruiting children to their cause is that it establishes that the men's behavior is nothing to do with sex because children are seen as innocent. The transvestites campaigned to get the medical profession to accept that they were really women and not just acting out of a sexual motivation. They engaged in decades of campaigning, including many threats and much bullying to persuade the sexologists to invent a new category of persons men who were really women, even though the vast majority kept their penises and often their beards. The diagnosis was invented of gender identity disorder. And then with this was changed because even that was seen as negative to gender dysphoria. Some sexologists like Ray Blanchard and Michael Bailey have never accepted that these men have innate gender identities and describe in detail the form that the men's sexual paraphilia takes, such as not just wanting to wear women's clothes, but also to change their bodies temporarily or permanently to acquire women's body parts, and to engage in behaviors that they think make them women, such as knitting. Over the last two decades, these men have campaigned for their gender rights. They have succeeded in getting protection of their identities into the law in many countries, so that they have the right to enter women's toilets, prisons, sports, shelters. They have worked behind the scenes to change policy so that gender identity is now taught in schools and thousands of children are being transgendered by drugs and surgery. Companies and organizations have been trained to introduce gender identity policies. Language has been changed in the health services and many other areas so that sex can no longer be mentioned. The effect of all this campaigning and organization by transgender activists has been to severely endanger women's human rights. The language of gender and the idea that there is something called gender identity, which is connected to lesbian and gay rights, has broadly infiltrated the landscape of rights work. Gender identity does not in fact have anything to do with lesbian and gay rights. Lesbians and gay men are not attracted to each other because of gender or sex stereotypes, but on the basis of sex, they are same sex attracted. Major NGOs have promoted the gender ideology at the UN. It has become harder and harder for women to work on behalf of women and protect the rights that we do have. The Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights was created because a group of women in the UK became aware of the very considerable threat this gradual erosion of the category of sex posed to women's rights. We were determined to mount a campaign to protect and promote women's rights against the intrusion of men with sexual paraphilias into the category women. We wrote the declaration and set up the Women's Human Rights Campaign to promote it. A new women's liberation movement is building in response to the threat posed by the advance of men's gender identity rights. It's an international movement. We hope that it will become as powerful and effective as the movement that made CEDAW, the Women's Convention, happen in the first place. So I'm just going to introduce now Gunda Schumann, who is our next speaker. She's from Germany and from Lesbian Action Center. And off you go. Thank you, Gunda. I will talk about 
Article 1 of the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, reaffirming that the definition of woman and lesbian in law and policy is based upon the category of sex, the same as laid down in Article 1 of CEDA Convention, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. I will show you how gender ideology is discriminating against women as adult human females and against lesbians as adult human females sexually attracted to other women and how this is infringing upon their human rights. Next slide, please. The gender ideology is using two tools. The first one, manipulation of language. The concept woman as an adult human female is being shifted to the concept of a person who has a female gender identity. That means socially constructed notions of gender. What does that mean? First, woman can also be an adult human male. Second, woman becomes a subset of her own. On the one hand, cis or biological woman. On the other hand, trans woman. Third, this shift in meaning has a ripple effect on lesbians. Lesbian is now a person who is sexually attracted to cis or biological and trans lesbians. That means heterosexual men. I give you three examples. Cotton ceiling. These are panties of cis or biological lesbians that have to be broken through by trans lesbians. This language reminds us of male violence. Second example, lady stick or girl dick. These are labels used for the male sexual organ. Third example, lesbians divided. In an academic study recently published by the German Federal Ministry on Family, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth, discrimination of lesbian women as a sexual minority is not more at issue in the European context. Instead, discrimination of lesbians as defined by their gender identity that means including men gains interest, focusing on socially disadvantaged subgroups of lesbians, such as homeless or refugees, vis-a-vis -vis well of cis or biological lesbians. Now to the second tool, the legal enforcement of gender ideology through self-ID. Next slide, please. The person who wants to change his or her recorded sex from male to female and vice versa, files an application with the state civil registry. What does that mean? First, a legal fiction applied in certain approved cases by state authorities, which means a man treated as a woman in public life, is being superseded by a personal declaration. Second, self-ID creates a presumption of access to female spaces instead of a presumption of exclusion for men. Third, self-ID decouples legal gender reassignment from any significant physical change. That means male appearance such as beard and body hair will be kept. Next slide, please. 
Now I will show you the consequences for women and especially for lesbians. First, the impact of shift in meaning on women and lesbians. Gender neutral speech, such as person with a female gender ident identity or person that is attracted to cis biological lesbians and trans lesbians, doesn't make biology get away. It just removes the analytical tools to understand oppression in our patriarchal society and to address it. First, bodily integrity and autonomy require that a woman may choose to exclude a male. Removing women's ability to withhold consent or to voluntarily accept the risk of assault strips them of autonomy and holds a real fears of sexual assault in contempt. Example, women's shelter accepting males creates anxiety and confusion among female victims of male violence. Second, invasion of men with a female gender identity into the intimacy and autonomous spaces of lesbians strips them of their sexual identity, thus preventing empowerment. Example, labeling the male sexual organ as lady stick or girl dick is gaslighting lesbians into heterosexuality. Third, when lesbians are defined on the basis of their gender identity, homosexual women are even more marginalized and disappear as a discriminated sexual minority in the public view. Now I come to the legal implications of self-ID. Self-ID renders the category of sex meaningless, thereby stripping women and lesbians of their sex-based rights. Next slide, please. What does that mean? Official statistics, usually based on the category of sex, get distorted. That means forecasts, measures, and opinions against sex discrimination would be impeded. Affirmative measures concerning parity laws, quotas, scholarships, women's sport, protection against domestic violence, freedom of opinion and assembly would and are already being threatened. Third, sex segregated spaces, toilets, women's shelters, prisons, and autonomous female spaces such as clubs, pubs, dating platforms would and are already been invaded by men who claim to be women. Next slide, please. Now I come to the conclusion. Sex exists. Trans women are subspecies of men and vice versa and language describing biological reality is valid. Only on the basis of this understanding, women's and lesbians' rights will be kept and defended. Thanks a lot for your attention. We're going to now hear from Anna Kerr from Australia. She's the principal solicitor at Feminist Legal Clinic, Inc. in Australia. Uh, over to you, Anna. I'm going to be focusing on Article 2 of the Declaration, which reaffirms motherhood as an exclusively female status. The next slide sets out uh, Article 2 in detail, but I won't read all of that, but just to say that um, it recognises, the Declaration recognises women's unique capacity to gestate and give birth to children and um, that the physical and biological characteristics that distinguish males and females mean that women's reproductive capacity cannot be shared by men who claim a female gender identity. So the Women's Human Rights Campaign recognises that not all women are mothers or even want to be, but that all mothers are women. However, this is getting rather confusing. The Australian National University has recently released 
a gender inclusive handbook that seriously recommends that we ditch the words mother and breastfeeding and instead refer to pregnant person and chest feeding. And this mirrors similar developments in many places around the world. It would be funny if it weren't so sinister. It's not only academics who are working to erase mothers, but also politicians everywhere. For example, parliaments in New South Wales and South Australia have recently passed otherwise welcome legislation to decriminalise abortion, but which entirely omit the words woman or mother. So this attempted erasure of mothers is happening not only in Australia, but as part of an orchestrated global movement to airbrush the words pregnant woman, breastfeeding and mothers from <laughs> our vocabulary. But in some parts of the world, women are beginning to fight back. A recent attempt to omit mothers from a maternity leave bill in the United Kingdom was hotly debated by the House of Lords recently with the result that the word mother has been retained in that context at least. But it's not only conservative people raising objections to this attempted change in language. There have been vocal complaints from black women in the United States about the offensiveness of being reduced to black birthing bodies, effectively stripping women of their humanity with language reminiscent of slavery. A legal case has also been brought um, in the United Kingdom to attempt to have mothers um, removed from birth certificates. In the United Kingdom, Freddie McConnell, who is a female who identifies as a man, brought legal proceedings to be registered as a father on their child's birth certificate, despite having given birth to the child. However, the appeal court ruled that motherhood is defined as being pregnant and giving birth despite the fact that other nonsensical legislation has allowed a female to be legally considered a man in law. Next slide, please. Um, but since we know only females can give birth, is this all just a matter of semantics? I mean, does it matter? We know that um, all those individuals who were in the previous slide who appear to be pregnant are in fact female, despite um, what they might've done to cosmetically alter their appearance. Uh, but unfortunately, all of this is taking a context where mothers really are being erased, not just linguistically, but in practice. We are seeing the removal of children from socioeconomically disadvantaged mothers, especially in developing countries, to meet an increasing demand for babies, particularly by gay male couples. And there are some of the babies that were stranded uh, recently as a result of COVID. Contractual rights, as in surrogacy agreements, are overriding the human rights of women and children. Wealthy men are, or are ordering babies as if they are the latest consumer good. There is also a growing trend in Western countries, at least, to forcibly remove children from mothers and place them with their fathers when there has been a relationship breakdown. Disturbingly, this is increasingly happening um, in circumstances where there is a context of domestic violence or unresolved allegations of child sexual abuse against the father. So women who cannot afford a child have long been at risk of having them removed and handed to those with more money. Um, earning capacity is increasingly taking precedence as the criteria determining whether an individual gets the opportunity to parent. Women are being reduced to breeding vessels for the wealthy and children are being traded as commodities. Furthermore, money is also being invested in technologies that will allow men to dispense with mothers altogether, including artificial wombs, womb transplants into men and cloning technologies. This desperation by men to develop technologies, these technologies makes one wonder whether the male species really is in its death throes. And that picture there is of a, the bio bag, which is an artificial womb that is in development. So why does all this matter? Isn't this a biological essentialism? And I would say yes, because the mother-child attachment does have a physiological basis and it does constitute a crucial bond in a child's development. To plan to begin a life with the trauma of being separated from one's mother is hardly in a child's best interest. I believe what I hear from adoptee rights activists who tell me that the disruption of this attachment results in a primal wound that doesn't ever fully heal. I also believe that mothers play an essential safeguarding role protecting children from male violence and that the removal of a child from its mother is cruel and unusual punishment and a significant infringement of human rights of both mother and child. So Article 12 of CEDAW requires that states ensure that women have equal rights with men in relation to family planning 
despite the fact that women have a far greater exposure to risk and investment in having a child, I would suggest that this is one area where women require additional rights. Human rights instruments recognise the family as the fundamental unit of society and extend little protection to the unique bond between a mother and child. In my experience, protecting the family is a euphemism often for protecting the rights of fathers. For example, in Australia, a men's rights group known as the Australian Brotherhood of Fathers, ABF, has now established a political party called Australian Better Families, also ABF. On the basis of their mere ejaculation, Australian family laws place men in a position to exercise control over every aspect of a woman and child's life, including controlling where they can live, their activities and decisions in relation to healthcare, education, etc. This applies even if the father is failing, like so many, to provide any level of child support. Indeed, these laws apply even in the case of men who are rapists or are otherwise abusive or violent to the mother. It is increasingly difficult for women um, to be successful with those kind of allegations. While it's true that not all women are mothers, all mothers are women, and giving birth has a very significant physical and psychological impact on a woman. The same does not apply to men who may conceive a child and never know it's born or suffer any feeling of loss. Correspondingly, a child will not miss its genetic father if separated at birth, but will suffer significant distress if removed from its mother. It is also still the case that mothers continue to be primary caregivers for children in the vast majority of cases. Furthermore, in view of the greater male propensity for violence and sexually abusive behaviours, I would suggest that women should think very carefully before trading the status of motherhood for some ill-conceived gender ideology and flimsy promises of equality. We're now going to hear from Marie-Claire Farré. She is from the Democratic Re Republic of Congo, uh, a research scientist, freelance consultant on gender and human rights defender from Common Cause UK and the Democratic Republic of Congo on reaffirming the right of women and girls to physical reproductive integrity. I believe that all women rights are born equal and have equal human rights, which I fully respect as much as I lack like to respect my right and my ex day right. Women's physical experience from birth to death is all linked to their reproductive organ as they have specific needs which have been used to sterilize them, control them, objectify them, and expose them. Human equality does not move biological reality. Our physiological difference does make an equal bio or any other way. Yes, yeah, so as I said, I'm myself a survivor of sexual violence in both childhood and adulthood. And coming from a continent, where the physical and reproductive integrity of young girls and women have been and continue to be breached by harmful pressure on their sex, which negatively affect their human right to physical and mental development, as well as help them to reach their full potential as human beings, I have been raising my voices for over 20 years to denounce all form of violence against women, harmful practices, behavior and attitude, which negatively affect the fundamental right of women and girls in Africa. And such as the, the, their right to live and to have health and dignity, education and physical integrity has been breached, particularly women who have been subjected to rape to female, to female genital mutilation, to scarification, medicalization and paramedicalization, all form of exploitation and cruel inhuman and degrading punishment and all treatment that have been prohibited by legal frameworks such as CEDO and the Maputo protocol. I have been denouncing that for over 20 years. In the Congo, as I was just explaining, women have been subjected and have been condemned to gender roles that dehumanize them and objectify as, as well as exploit them at every level of our society. Most of them, many of them, who are in the east of the Congo, where the war has been waged, the Congo is actually being labeled the capital of rape. It's the capital of rapists and misogynists, and also violence, uh, the violation of their right to live and, and to the physical integrity and the security of their person has been breached by all these who are taking up arms there and who are using women's body as a weapon of war. 
female genital mutilation has been is still being used in 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 many parts of, of Africa. In Egypt, for instance, it is shocking to see that eighty percent of women have been excised. I mean, young girls are still being excised in countries such as Mali, Guinea, even Kenya, and even in some part of the DRC, even though we are a nation where this practice has completely, completely been banned by our legal framework. And as we know, female genital mutilation often cause serious urinary problem and obstetric complication during pregnancy and, and childbirth. Both mothers and babies are exposed to risk and some of which prove to be fatal. Over the decades of research work that I have undertaken, uh, and uh, I've noticed and I, uh, that due to the, the intergenerational oppression of women, lack of education, dehumanization, there is also a link between violence against women, femicide, and a great ignorance and misunderstanding of women's reproductive organ, particularly of women's menstrual cycle. Hence, stereotyping women as weak, stupid, mysterious women being, uh, being uh, uh, ready to be controlled and protected, guided in everything, hence being oppressed and abused. Many women in Africa are taken hostage in cultural and religious setting run mostly by men. Patriarchy and violent masculinity are reinforced by religious ideology that are embedded in religious texts without any scientific evidence or biological fact. All this just by gender stereotyping women. So challenging patriarchy and promoting gender uh, uh, and sex equality for social co cohesion is often perceived as challenging religious faith and culture. And for instance, uh, challenging uh, uh, female genital mutilation is more of a said as an attack on religious and tradition in some parts of Africa. And some of the religious leaders such as pastor in fundamental Christian churches are using gender stereotype to prey on women and to control them. So there is an ignorance of the female reproductive organ. And this ignorance of the women, uh, 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 female physiology uh, uh, lead to distrust and, 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 and lack of confidence, curiosity, taboo, abuse, shame and violence, hatred. Our biological identity should not be erased and it is very important to our specific needs as human and as we are not homogeneous, but heterogeneous and specific. If you see this next slide, I've left it in French for all of my Francophone sisters, but I know that some of the English one will see. Even women's secretion are sometimes used to stereotype women. Some women are not even aware of their full reproductive organ and why they have secretion. And all these are being used to abuse them and to chosify them, to objectify them. So ignorance of biological reality leads to different form of violence in human being in general, but specifically leads to violence against women, such as uh, psychological violence, institutional violence, cultural violence, discrimination and economic violence and violence. Through ignorance of our biological reality and concept, individuals participate in atrocity from an inability to critically examine blind allegiance to ideology and stereotype that provide a sense of meaning comfort in a lonely and alienated world. Therefore, being part of the women uh, human rights campaign, I reaffirm as we reaffirm the right of girls and women to physical and reproductive uh, integrity. States should ensure that the full reproductive right of women and girls and, and hinder access to comprehensive reproductive services are upheld. States should recognize that harmful practices such as forced pregnancy and the commercial and altruistic exploitation of women's reproductive capacity involving surrogate motherhood are violation of the physical and reproductive integrity of girls and women and are to be eliminated as form of sex-based discrimination. States should recognize that medical research, which is aimed at enabling men to gestate and give birth to children is a violation of the physical and reproductive integrity of girls and women. And it, it is to be eliminated as a form of sex-based discrimination. Thank you very much. Freedom of expression is also not absolute and the state can restrict it when the restrictions must be necessary and proportionate to the sought aim. The measure must be necessary for a democratic society and be the least restrictive means of achieving a legitimate aim. It must be clear in the balance of rights 
that the benefit to the protection of women's rights exceeds the harm of freedom of expression and that no other less restrictive measures could achieve the same effect. Article four of the WHRC declaration speaks to freedom of opinion to describe others on the basis of their sex and not their gender, which would desensitize persons to matters pertaining to gender, as these freedoms are private feelings, mannerisms and behaviors that should not be a means to discriminate against anyone because of one's individual autonomy. The matter pertaining to gender ideology has become a bigger issue due to the deepening of these dynamics within society by bending society's logic and facilitating the shrinking, not only of women's safe spaces, but also of democracy and, safe, and civic spaces. Women should not be compelled to call their perpetrator, she, her, or other pronouns in the plural form, which when expressed brings chaos and confusion. Framing the narrative goes a long way as we see that in the UK, these dynamics are very prevalent in terms of the idea of using plural nouns to address individuals as it pertains to gender. Countries adopt practices of other countries and the social aspects pertaining to gender that can become lost in the cultural confusion due to demographics as well as close cultural net ties with other countries. I personally would use English, for example, in terms of the way that specific words are spelled in further highlighting the significance of these subtle but largely harmful matters of gender that produce chaotic nuances of compounded human and civil rights. Further, Article 4 of the WHRC Declaration is an infringement of the right to freedom of expression and undermines access to justice from a criminal justice context. Women should be able to accurately report and give evidence against those that assault them. If women cannot accurately report crimes committed against them, it then becomes impossible for the police to gather evidence to facilitate and foster justice and peaceful societies. It further becomes impossible to collect data to develop programs that protect women and reduce or eliminate violence against them. The police and the courts should not force women to describe their attackers according to their claimed gender identity rather than their sex. Although the right to freely express one's gender identity is a part of this article, it, in, particularly this, in particular, this specific issue becomes a matter of whose right, whose rights is more important. And in that sense, a perpetrator also has rights However, it is offensive and very discriminatory and unconstitutional to have such matters become the norm as it undermines justice and sets a precedent that weakens the rule of law and incites civil unrest. Police officers are then writing reports relative to every person's presumed perspective of how they see it versus what is reality. It is then difficult to maintain peace and have access to justice. Partly, there has been a universal decline in terms of access to justice and peaceful societies due to decline in the rule of law and in democratic processes. And so this directly impacts the fundamental social structures of women for policy and program development at the regional, sub-regional and country level, not only in the Bahamas, but universally, especially pertaining to gender equity put in place for countries, particularly the Caribbean, as the indicators for the region are based on gender-based violence and its elimination and not violence against women specifically. This undermines women in parliamentary leadership and allows for the inclusion of men who identify as women. This further allows bad policies to be established without the focus on any particular sex. This can go both ways, and thus is a threat to women's safe spaces when those spaces become gender neutral, which cause accelerated aggression and violence for women. Gender ideology leaves very few women's organizations that promote women's rights and violence against women, specifically without a gender lens, as gender does not specifically apply to women and girls, and most organizations draw from gender equality networks. This is specifically relative to the data available and has major impacts pertaining to gender ide ideology due to the narrative that is undefined. Thank you.
we're now going to hear from Kathleen Lowry from Canada. She's Universe, Associ Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Alberta. I will be speaking to women's rights to peaceful freedom of assembly and association. So this right is abrogated by men and male authorities under the banner of both tradition and progress. What I'd like to speak about today is the way that it must be women who decide how their rights to freedom of assembly and association are exercised. When women's rights to peaceful freedom of assembly and association are abrogated in the name of tradition, men and male authorities say that their values either are or ought to be shared by women, such that women who do mind the abrogation of these rights don't matter. Of course, women object to being shut out of public life in the name of tradition, as for example, Indira Gandhi observes here very sharply about the memories of her mother of being shut out of public life in the name of tradition. When women's rights to peaceful to peaceful freedom of assembly and association are abrogated by men and male authorities in the name of progress, these male authorities again say that their values either already are shared by women or ought to be shared by women. Again, women object and are organizing to say so. While the traditional approach is to deny women access to public life, the progressive approach is to deny women private, a private life. In particular, women are enjoined socially and increasingly legally to open intimate spaces to trans identified males. So this image is from a campaign by a United Kingdom women's organization that among other things, they're campaigning to keep trans identified men out of women's prisons. Now women's prisons are one of the many women's spaces in many countries that are being forcibly open to males in the name of progress. The point is, whether in the name of tradition or in the name of progress, for either, whether forcibly keeping women out of public space or forcing men into women's spaces, these are decisions taken by male authorities, justified by male authorities as for the general good, and they are decisions to which, of course, women object very strongly. Women's ability to object and their ability not only to gather and discuss these objections, but to have these objections reflected in legislation and policy, these are fundamental rights. The ability to gather together to discuss our, our rights, the ability to have the decisions we make, the, the ideas that we circulate in these gatherings, the ability to have these decisions reflected in public policy. This is at the basis of all the other rights that we're talking about today. If, if we cannot do this, we cannot defend any of the rights that we've talked about today. This is not a hypothetical problem, but a very urgent one. In countries like my own, Canada that style themselves as progressive, women are being threatened and punished for asserting their rights to peaceful freedom of assembly and association. So in Canada, there's an organization called Vancouver Rape Relief. It offers women only services for women facing domestic violence, women facing sexual assault. We know that domestic violence and sexual assault are primarily forms of male violence. So this offers services to women facing male violence. In 2019, Vancouver Rape Relief was stripped of funding by the Vancouver City Council because of their women-only policy and faced violent misogynist attacks, including having a rat nailed to its front door by trans activists. The phrase kill turfs was sprayed on its entry. Turfs, are, are, is an acronym for trans exclusionary radical feminists. This is a term usually used as a term of abuse. What it means is women like the women in Vancouver Rape Relief who do not wish to open their spaces to men. So who, for example, do not wish to open a rape shelter to trans identified men. 
These attacks are the mirror image of similar informal and formal sanctions <clears throat> applied to women who object to being excluded from public life in traditional settings. So that the objections to women to having their private spaces invaded by men, the attacks made on women for objecting to that, exactly parallel the attacks made on women who object to being shut out of public life in traditional settings. So on the surface, these look very different, but the, the kinds of discipline applied to women who object to decisions made by men in the name of progress and the kinds of discipline applied to women um, who object to decisions by, made by men in the, in the name of tradition, the, the violence and the disciplinary force and the, um, the recruitment, not just so the, the combination of both informal sanctions of shaming, of harassment, combined with the recruitment of legal authority to enforce these practices, these are exactly the same. The rights of women to peaceful freedom of association and assembly have two faces. The first is the right to public participation in civic deliberation and the life of their culture. So that includes just walking around, just seeing what's going on, being allowed to freely walk around, being allowed to go to school, being allowed to go to music shows, being allowed to visit museums, being allowed to go to sports events. That kind of publication, pub participation in the full banquet of public life is an important feature of women's rights to peaceful freedom of association and assembly. And we're probably more familiar with these rights being under attack in traditionalist societies. Um, but the second face of women's rights to peaceful freedom of association and assembly is the right to a dignified private life. The right to be safe in intimate spaces like changing rooms, to be able to seek safe harbor when in danger from male violence, to have even in prison. So even if you've violated the terms of your society in such, in such a way that you've been sent to prison, the right even in prison to a sense of security in going about the intimate business of bathing, toileting, dressing, and sleeping. Safe access to public life and security of private existence are mutually constitutive. It is why men are careful in every setting to guarantee these rights to themselves. These are these mutually constitutive aspects, the, the, the safe access to public life and security of private existence, these underpin women's rights to peaceful freedom of assembly and association. We expect the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women to defend and uphold these rights for women around the world and in any context under which they're, they're threatened, whether that context is a traditional context or whether that tradition that context is a putatively progressive context. Thank you very much. We will now um, here go to Maria Bonetti. She's from Argentina, a researcher in feminist philosophy, philosophy from IE, IIEGE UBA and Connecticut Set Argentina. I'm going to talk on the Article 6 of our declaration that reaffirmed women's right to political participation on the basis of sex, following CEDAW Article 7, which called to take all appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women in the political and public life of the country. We have fought long and hard to participate in political and public life. The suffragist movement at the beginning of the 20th century is the most clear example uh, it entailed a broad program for women to access to political and civil life as full citizen, both uh, education, work, wages, maternal rights, etc. This program remains unfaithful in most of the planet. In many countries, women don't have any participation at all, and in the rest, the participation is unequal and follows different standards for male and for women. The improvement of substantive equality demands concrete and efficient policies, programs, and special measures like women-only positions and quota systems in politics, 
corporate organizations, civil associations, international agencies, academy, sport, prizes, scholarship, grants, access to financial resources, to justice, to services, etc., etc. That means in any field of public and social life. Parity 50-50 is the main positive discrimination measures to protect the right of human to an equitable representation, fair distribution of resources and power, decision making, etc. However, if men who claim to feel a female gender identity are included in the category of human, and then into all these specific female entitlements, it means discrimination against human and impairs equal treatment and opportunities. The system of parity, women-only positions, quotas, and all the special measures, everything is lot for women taken over by male who, who self-identify as a woman. The result is that we have a double criterion for women's sexual rights, the criterion of women's sexual rights and the criterion of male internal feeling to be human that allows take advantage of all special measures to increase human civic, political and public life. I want to take as an example the case of Argentina. I'm Argentinian. Um, where the confusion between sex and gender is undermining our rights and erasing human as legal category. In Argentina, we have a ministry of human genders in plural. You see in the picture genders and diversity. That means a, a ministry for everybody, for women and, and for men, encompassed in the category of genders, a, a global category that includes women among many other genders. Genders is everything. Um, women are one of the genders between many genders, among many genders, and this category distinguishes women from lesbians or bi bisexual people. All programs and plans of this ministry are addressed to all genders in many areas. For example, we have here a, a programa Igualar, which is a program uh, for equality among genders in the area of work, employment, and production. We have the same case in the area of science and technology, in which you see equality among genders, that means for women, lesbians, and um, all the spectrum of genders, women included. <clears throat> And we have the same case in, uh, for example, public health. Uh, that is very curious. This is from the Ministry of, of, of uh, Health. It's very curious because health is based on gender, not on bi biological sex or biological body, but um, on genders and diversity. We have a national plan for politics of uh, genders and diversity in public health. Genders are also included in women's quotas. You see here uh, the law of uh, female quotas. And this is a picture from the National Institute of Music, which explained that the quotas for women included self-identified men. Um, the confusion is such that it is not even, even possible to count how many sexes or gender there are. We have here, this is a, a form, we have many forms of this kind. This is a form from the Ministry of Culture for a, a prize uh, to, in the area of visual arts. And in the form, you have sex assigned to adverse, which is female and male, have, you have another category, which is just sex, female, male, intersexual, and transsexual. And we have the other category, which is genders, in which you have a uh, woman, men, uh, transsexual, transvestite, uh, gay, uh, non-binary, etc. That means that um, women are in any category. And for example, in gender, women are at the same level that transvestites or, or gay. Is it, 
that, that means we are a, a, a channel like any other channel. <clears throat> Uh, this is in the case that we are called human, because in many cases we are just pregnant people or menstruator or utero holder. Or even in the in the law, the category, the legal category of human is disappeared in Argentina. In this context, we have no idea which percentage of quotas, position, financial resources are for human and which percentage are for the rest of the genders. What is very, very clear is that women are no longer half plus one of the world population, including all races, classes, sexual orientation, opinion, belief, and self-representation. We are just a gender between many, among many other genders, a sexual orientation among many other sexual orientation. De facto, this minimizes women, and that is a strategy the minorization of human, the eternal strategy of patriarchy. We don't know either how Argentina will evaluate the improvement of substantive equality before CEDO, or for example, before the 2030 Global Agenda for Sustainable Development, which claims to ensure women full and effective participation and equal opportunities in political, economic and public life. We consider that the conflation between sex and gender is absolutely unsustainable. So, um, to conclude, we should make it clear to the United Nations that we are half plus one of the world population and its potential. We include all races, classes, sexual orientations, belief, opinion, and self-representation. And we demand the half plus, plus one that belong to our political, economic, and public life. So we are now going to hear uh, from Kara Dansky. She's the Women's Human Rights Campaign Chair of the Committee on Law and Legislation, and she's from the United States. Welcome, Kara. today to discuss Article 7 of the Declaration on Reaffirming Women's Rights to the Same Opportunities as Men to Participate Actively in Sports and Physical Education Globally. Article 7 states as follows, quote, Article 10G of the CEDAW provides that states parties shall ensure the same opportunities to participate actively in sports and physical education for girls and women as for boys and men. This should include the provision of opportunities for girls and women to participate in sports and physical education on a single sex basis. To ensure fairness and safety for women and girls, the entry of boys and men who claim to have female gender identities into teams, competitions, facilities, or changing rooms set aside for women and girls should be prohibited as a form of sex discrimination." Unquote. This articulation is entirely consistent with Title IX of the US Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in education, but allows for sex-specific sports and facilities, such as locker rooms and changing rooms. The US chapter of the Women's Human Rights Campaign is involved in ongoing efforts to advance our cause of protecting female-only sports before the International Olympic Committee and before the US-based National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA. These efforts involve unlikely partners across the political spectrum working together in a nonpartisan way. They include women, families, sports advocacy groups, legislators, athletes, and citizens. 
Why is this important? It is currently the policy of the International Olympic Committee that, quote, individuals undergoing sex assignment of male to female before puberty should be regarded as girls and women or female. This also applies to individuals undergoing female to male reassignment who should be regarded as boys and men or male, unquote. WHRC US rejects this formulation because it is WHRC's position that it is not possible to change sex or that a person can actually be the opposite sex. Second, it is currently the policy of the NCAA that male athletes who are being treated with testosterone suppression medication may compete in female only sports after completing one calendar year of testosterone suppression treatment. WHRC USA rejects this formulation as well. As Article 7 states, it is important for women and girls to be able to compete with and against other girls and women purely on the basis of sex. It should not matter if a male athlete is taking testosterone suppression treatment because he's still male. The harms of allowing male athletes to compete in female-only sports are well known. Males have physiological advantages over females in sports. This is the very underlying basis for separating males and females in athletics in the first place. It has been shown, for example, that this sex-based performance gap is around 10 to 50%, depending on the sport in question. The gap is more pronounced in sports that rely primarily on muscle mass and strength because the effects of testosterone suppression on muscle mass and strength are modest. There's no question that men and boys enjoy physiological advantages over girls and women in sports, regardless of hormone administration. In the US, there are two pending federal court cases that could soon help to clarify the United States federal judiciary's opinion on whether women and girls are entitled to female only sports under US federal law. One case is pending in federal court in Connecticut where four young women have bravely sued their state's athletic association over the association's policy of allowing boys to compete in girls sports. The other is in federal court in Idaho, where state law protects female only sports and a young man is suing the state for refusing to allow him to participate in girls sports. There are two bills currently pending before the US Congress that would protect female only sports by prohibiting males from competing in them on the basis of sex. One of them called the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act would ensure that Title IX provisions relating to athletics treat sex as that which is recognized based solely on a person's reproductive biology and genetics at birth. This language is consistent with Article 7 of the Declaration. In addition, two US states have codified the protection of female only sports in state law, Idaho and Mississippi. There are an additional 50 bills to protect women's sports being considered in 29 additional states. In the US, efforts to protect women's sports continue to gain speed. As signatories to the declaration, WHRC USA is extremely supportive of these efforts and plan to continue to support them in the coming years. Thank you. We're now moving to Linda Louis Lewis. She is uh, from a legal professional from South India with a background in the laws of war and international human rights law. She carried out extensive research on the law practice and social initiatives relating to sexual violence against women across jurisdictions. Thank you so much and over to you, Linda. Something I'm going to be focusing on and reaffirm in, in my presentation on Article 8 is how the entire framework of the gender identity movement is not just misogynistic, but is also an exercise of, again, colonial powers and, and almost a neo-colonial exercise. So Article 8 primarily borrows from the 1993 UN Declaration Against Women. So that's the first thing that we have to remember is that very little in this declaration and in our demand for single sex facilities or for facilities for our recovery is new. These things have been around since the 1990s. They're already part of soft law and normative standards in international law, but somehow they have been overruled or rather forgotten and reinterpreted. When it comes especially to violence against women, the fact that women need single sex spaces in order to recover has been recognized at every level of the law and of practice. I've just used a couple of examples here and in the next couple of slides that traumatized women require female counselors, female forensic examiners, as well as 
female spaces, female only spaces to recover. This is again enshrined in law, not just in the West, but also in developing countries. In India, there is a requirement that if possible, a rape victim should only be examined doctor. The response to this by the gender identity movement has been that this does not matter or that the comfort level will be the same if the person just looks female. Now, this is both insulting as well as false, that the fact that women, traumatized women or women in need cannot identify who is giving care to them is completely false. It's also argued that having a female doctor or a female uh, first responder does not solve the problem because sometimes they also react quite negatively or with response to myths. That is not an argument to say that therefore the, the overriding likelihood that female uh, doctors, responders and counselors will be better is still a good thing. Some states in the US and in the West usually require first responders to be female. The reason I've mentioned this is because we have to counter the argument that, or, or rather not fall for the argument that single sex spaces are somehow new and that it's conservative to want women to be attended to by women. Because a, the simple fact of comfort has been acknowledged so much that it is regarded as a normative standard. It doesn't even, it didn't need to be spelled out before, whereas now we are facing increasing calls to, to justify why we may not want to um, have, men uh, have men examining. When it comes to toilets, this is what I meant by a neo-colonialist, um, that this is a neo-colonialist endeavor. All, but uh, studies by UNICEF, the United Nations Development Program, the joint monitoring program, with, uh, which is supposed to be um, looking at the implementation of the SDGs, all agree that for basic hygiene, women will need to have separated toilets. But somehow, this is forgotten when it comes to developed countries, as if the girls in developed countries are not eligible for the very same basic facilities that the United Nations recommends for developing countries. There is plenty of evidence, almost all major UN development bodies originally in the mid nineties recommended and continue to recommend that just to keep girls in school, they're going to need clean, accessible and safe toilets because if they have to go out and or if they have to share the uh, place with men that they're not going to go there and that they're going to drop out of school. While this is accepted wisdom for the developing world, the girls in developed countries and, and in Western countries are being deprived of this. It's, it's, rever it's, it's almost reversal of, of, the, of human dignity that's afforded to girls in developing countries being, reject, being refused to the girls in the global north. Another thing is that uh, while I haven't stated the example here, single sex spaces, not just rape refuges or facilities or, or toilets, but other spaces such as assigned metro carriages, assigned suburban rail carriages, single sex cab services are all possible in the developing world. And the UN, UN Women has recognized that these make a difference. We have plenty of examples where single sex facilities don't need to be guarded by walls or, or by people with guns or any other form of actual physical barriers. The strength of social norms is sufficient and this argument has to be rejected. Right, this is just what I stated that um, the WHO program acknowledges that sex separated toilets are necessary, whereas UNICEF is now changing its turn. Right, sex desegregated data. Um, again, as a woman from India and from South Asia, this is particularly concerning because latest laws from Pakistan state that they can self ID. These are countries in which female infanticide and feticide is the highest in the world. And not only are we now having an issue of it's hard enough trying to keep them alive, we are now being faced with a situation where the entire statistics on this issue can be blurred if self ID is even a reality. The United Nations and anyone who is pushing this without recognizing that this will eviscerate 
the movement against female infanticide and feticide in South Asia are, are out of their minds. One, a, more than 100,000 female fetuses are estimated to have been aborted in Pakistan. In India, that it, we can't even estimate the actual number because there are simply too many. What we do know is that the sex ratio has dropped from 972 per thousand in the last decade to 929 girls for every thousand men. That's, that's in addition to the 2 million girls that we know are missing from India and Pakistan in the last two decades. And if the mere notion that self-ID can even be a reality in these countries means we, do not, we no longer have the, the possibility to count these issues. And se secondly, in violence against women in terms of domestic violence, a common argument made these days is that, well, women also commit domestic violence. So therefore it does not matter whether the sex of the perpetrator is recorded, except that it completely matters because the very nature of the violence that men commit against women and women commit against men is very different as we can see women experience much higher rates of victimization, they are more likely to be seriously hurt and they experience higher levels of fear. Secondly, um, not, just, not just in experiencing fear, women are more likely to die in domestic violence altercations. Their violence is much more likely to be the, caused by fear or in response to male violence rather than them being the initiators of violence. Whether, wh whichever side we fall on in terms of what domestic violence is, that does not matter. The point is these two things are very different and sex dis disaggregated data is still vitally important and it is irresponsible to even imagine not recording these, this information. Uh, finally, the fact that women are being stopped or even uh, emotionally blackmailed or, or the male signifiers for the, uh, when they're being attacked is another grievous insert, not just for the purposes of accuracy, but because women are not even able to talk about the violence being committed against them anymore in a way that makes sense in their minds. This is an extract from a recent British case where Michelle, Michelle Winter, a, a woman, a, a man identifying as a trans, was found to be guilty. And most laws on the planet still clearly state that rape can only be committed by a penis, in which case now we are, as, as already pointed out by my fellow panelists, we are being called to accept male violence or, or, or the concept of the lady dick or female penis. This is horrendously insulting. From the perspective of, of a country that has extremely high rates of sexual violence, it is worse than insulting. It is a grievous violation of human dignity. Not to mention that if this is being done in English, because courtesy of colonialism, English is the dominant language throughout the world, this does not even take into account the issues of what happens in other languages and, and how you would translate this in other languages. And all the entire development community that is pushing this has completely forgotten this issue. While this is happening in the West and this is not yet spread to the global South or rather to Asia, it is still a very concerning development that basic courtesy is not being extended to women and that we are being robbed of the language to even describe our experiences. If we don't have the language to describe our experiences, we cannot do anything about it. And no, none of our arguments are Eurocentric. The current uh, discussion of transgenderism is the one that's Eurocentric. And again, this is coming from a person who's from India, who, know, who knows about the hijras. They have been co-opted. Most of the in, uh, languages of the of, of South Asia or even the older languages have the same terms for sex and gender. Gender is not regarded as a completely different concept. And they themselves describe themselves as not man or women. It is only the modern movement that is pushing this. And now there is an increasing split between the older transsexuals or eunuchs or various other English terms and the newer trans movement who want who are claiming the same things that the people in the West are claiming, but this was not the case. And they simply explained themselves in various other terms, which again, my very uh, esteemed panelists have already dealt with. So no, nothing about this is Eurocentric. In fact, everything about this is neo-colonialist. Um, thank you.
We're now going uh, over to Brazil, Eugenia Rodriguez. She's the spokesperson for No Corpo Certo in the right body. She's also the Women's Human Rights Campaign representative in Brazil. Over to you, Eugenia. One of the most important tools to end discrimination against women is raise boys and girls with equality. Both of them should have the right to live, grow, get education, healthcare, be treated with love, respect, and play. Let kids be kids means allowing them playing with whatever toys and activities they want, have friends of both sexes, letting girl, girls play in the mud, and letting boys take ballet classes. All of us know most girls and most women do not like do not look like Barbies, and most men and most boys are not GI Joe. According to the Article 5 of the CEDAW, states' parties shall take all appropriate measures to eliminate practices which are based on stereotyped roles for men and women. Thus, kids that do not conform to stereotypes are just normal kids, and all the suffering they experiment by being out of the boxes has to end. Unfortunately, stereotype rules, stereotyped roles are the basis of so-called diagnosis of gender incongruence, the current name for gender dysphoria in children and adolescents. adolescents. DSM diagnoses statistical manual, which is used as a guideline around the world, including here in Brazil, this is a signs of incongruence, quoting, preferences for cross-dressing, for cross-gender roles in make-believe play or fantasy play, for the toys, games, or activities stereotypically used or engaged in by the other gender, and for playmates of the other gender. End of their words. Well, why are doctors concerned about these behaviors? They're not pathological. Uh, these kids are not harming themselves and they are not harming other, other people. Do these patients really have a problem? Or do we have a problem as a society that rejects gender nonconformity? The criteria also mention strong desire of being the other gender and strong body discomfort. But how many girls first centuries dreamed of having the same privileges of their brothers. How many of us hate our bodies until now because of unrealistic beauty standards or sexual abuse or body disorders, which again are more common in girls? This diagnosis justified that medical doctors prescribe puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and in some countries, even irreversible surgeries, which in USA, are performed in teens as young as 13. As the spokesperson of a Brazilian campaign against trans and kids, I've done lots of research and these substances are dangerous. As a recent article on in the, the independent warns us, I'm quoting, halting puberty is not without health consequences including the, risks, uh, the risk of suppression of normal bone density development and greater risk of osteoporosis, loss of sexual function, interference with brain development, and possibly suppressing PKQ. These are the physical effects. There are also the psychological effects of remaining in a childlike state while their peers grow and mature. For girls who want to transition, next comes the question of testosterone, and that too has health implications, including risks of vaginal atrophy, muscle weights, painful cramping due to endometriosis, painful orgasms, increased sweating, moodiness, and aggression. Long-term effects include heightened rates of diabetes, stroke, blood clots, cancer, and heart disease. End of quotation. Is it a coincidence that this diagnosis rocket in every single country where medical doctors manage to decrease the age to body interventions. And that the investigative therapy for these cases started to be labeled as conversion therapy. 
and their gender identity started to be pushed at schools? Is it really about diversity or just money and regressive stereotypes? How do you prevent parents to transition their kids? Because as a famous father of a so-called trans girl in Brazil, they didn't want a gay son. Some of you might support these inter interventions in adults, but we certainly should consider the special condition of children and teens. These interventions are harmful practices as defined both by CETO and the Committee on the Rights of the Child. It damages their mental and physical health and it might sterilize them at an age they are not fully mature to make this kind of decision. The Article 9 of our declaration requires states reaffirming the need for the protection of the rights of the child. It's a right of boys and girls being different and it's our duty to protect them. Yes, Senator, in our declaration, we help us to make this protection happen. Thank you. Obrigada. So we're now going to Amparo Domingo. She's the Women's Human Rights Country Contact in Spain and will tell us about Spanish language networking, amongst other things. Over to you, Amparo. We have just presented you all nine of articles of the Declaration on Women's Sex Based Rights, a document that has been supported so far by almost 16,000 people from 129 countries. And it also has the support of uh, over 300 organizations from all over the world. Women's Human Rights Campaign, as Sheila has explained, is the radical feminist organization responsible for creating the Women's Declaration, as this document is also known. The declaration was created when the founders of WHRC realized feminists should devise a legal document to fight the replacement of sex by gender identity in law, policy, and social practice which is creating new forms of discrimination against women and girls all over the world. We are a truly global organization as we attested today in this presentation where women from five continents are participating live in it from Australia to Canada, including India, Congo, Germany, United Kingdom, Spain, Argentina, Brazil, and the United States. So far, WHRC has representatives in 33 countries, which is a sign of both how widespread this replacement of gender, of sex with gender identity is, and how concerned but also deeply motivated women are. Women are uniting and creating new networks of, uh, and alliances internationally and within their own countries to show our opposition to this denial of our physical existence and to the erasure of the legal category of women in our laws. In Spain, where I live, numerous groups of radical feminists have been launched in the past months, alarmed at the attempts of our government to legalize the self-identification of sex in official documents. Many of them, along with already existing feminist organizations, have conjoined in a platform called Confluencia Movimiento Feminista, of which WHRC Spain is a member of, in order to jointly oppose this new piece of legislation, since it would be a de facto invalidation, for instance, of our current bill on gender-based violence, which is considered to be a very progressive piece of legislation and an example of good practice in that field. Together, we are creating new materials to denounce the cover changes in legislation that have already been done like in education, for instance, since now Spanish teachers have become a sort of gender police that are compelled to intervene under the suspicion of having a trans kid in their classroom if any student deviates from stereotypical gender behavior, which are cliches, under the protocols introduced via regional legislation in most parts of our country. This is just an example of how bad things are here at the moment. Internationally, we have different ways of working collaboratively. One, it is uh, within WHRC itself by creating language-based networking, for instance. Spanish-speaking country contacts for WHRC decided last year to work together to create content in Spanish language for our countries. We started that collaboration by presenting the declaration to Spain and Latin America last August, and we have continued periodically 
to bring awareness to this matter in our own uh, native language. So far, we have had philosophical discussions with prominent feminists. We have defended women's sports. We have stood up against censorship and harassment to those brave feminists that are daring to speak up. And we have shown how bad the situation is in Argentina in terms of women's rights, nine years after that country passed their self-ID law that has overturned the meaning of equality and inclusion by expelling women from governmental policies. We plan to keep on making as much information as possible available for Spanish speaking women. I'd like to mention that, of course, our German sisters are also creating content in their own language for German speakers and will soon will have webinars in French language too. Globally, Women's Human Rights Campaign is creating a vibrating feminist community at the same time that we highlight and expose the extent to which the changes of legislation are being carried out in different countries. We are networking with feminists from all over the world and our YouTube channel is testimony to the experiences of dozens of them and how these changes are affect affecting the daily lives of women and girls in many different countries. This is something very important since most of the changes in legislation have so far been carried out without public debate. So by producing this material, we help feminists from other countries to have a better perspective on the whole situation and also help them to start new, collabor new collaborations among them. By doing all this, Women's Human Rights Campaign is leading the defense of women's sex-based rights globally, and we invite all women concerned about this matter to join us. Thank you very much.